Welcome to this series of videos giving tips and tricks on getting the most out of Rhapsody and Ada. In this model I've got two classes, one called Timer and one called Display, both using a NoO pattern from your mail to Ada. We're going to use these two classes to explain what model-driven development is by creating a running stopwatch application. The UML profile here is overriding default code generation properties, including placing more information in the footers rather than headers of the files. Note also that I've set the roundtrip philosophy to the newer advanced roundtrip scheme, where more than just changes to code in operation bodies will be roundtripped. The first thing to understand about using a model-driven approach is the notion that the code and the model are really the same thing. Or to be more precise, the model contains everything it needs to know in order to regenerate the code. Of course, it would normally contain a lot more, such as use cases and traceability to requirements, and things usually done before coding to ensure you build the right system first time. Typically, your model would consist of many structural and behavioural diagrams to illustrate and share the design between developers and other stakeholders, helping to ensure design quality. Capturing the design protects the project from the inevitable risks that key developers may leave or new developers may join the project. This is especially important for avionics systems that typically need to be maintained for many years. Although we're generating everything from the model, that's not to say that you can't make changes in the code and have them round-tripped in. For example, if we highlight the timer class here, we can see in the active code view that Rhapsody generates both the ADA specification and body files for the corresponding class. The active code view is context sensitive and we can make changes to the implementation bodies for the operations. For example, we can add an implementation for the tick operation body. This will be round shipped into the model and then regenerated. In addition to the tick operation, we'll add a with ada.text.io to the package body for timer. We'll also add a new attribute called mins to the object record. And finally, we'll add a new operation called print to the ADA specification. Note that when we change context, the change is reverse engineered into the model. With the advanced property enabled, the roundship involves running a parser and a reverse engineering rule set to map the changes into your mail too. Once Rhapsody has determined that the changes to the code are new, it adds them to the model and then regenerates. As such, we're still using very much a model-driven approach with Ada here. However, the advanced roundship potentially provides more comfort to developers who are used to hand coding, whilst giving the project the added benefits of capturing the design. Note that when the context clause is reverse engineered, Rapsi adds a dependency relationship between the class and the externally marked text.io class in the model. If we drag it onto the diagram canvas, we can see this relationship visually. We can also see that a property is set on the usage dependency to generate the use clause. Of course, a picture paints a thousand words, and we can see from the diagram that the relationship between the timer class and text.io is somewhat odd. Really, the relationship to text.io should come from the display class, surely. We'll move the source of the dependency to the display class instead. We'll then use the implementation tab of the show operation to provide a quick implementation that uses a text.io put line statement. We'll get the put line to output the values of the min argument and the sex argument that are being passed in the call. And we'll put a colon between the two numbers. Once we've done this, we'll get the print operation in the timer class to invoke the show operation in the its display object. Immediately, the OO features of Ada in concert with its use in Rhapsody start to come alive, since I can invoke the operation on the its display object and elide the Ada package completely. Of course, you don't need to use Rhapsody with Ada 2005. It's just a nice feature to show how Ada has evolved over the years to support OO design better. The next thing we're going to do is to generate and build the code. 
Of course, to run something we need a main procedure to invoke. Since these are classes, we also need to get the main to create the objects and initialize them. Although you could create a main procedure by hand, Rhapsody is able to automatically generate this from settings in the UML configuration. There are great options available. In this instance, we're going to use a feature of UML2 known as a composite or structured class. We'll begin by adding a new class to the diagram called Builder. Essentially, any class in the model can contain parts that are instances of other classes. The composite structure compartments shown here can be used to link them together. We can then tell Rhapsody to automatically generate a main which will initialize an object of this type. We can also add ADA code into it using the initialization code box here. Now we can build the code using the make button in Rhapsody's code generation toolbar. Rhapsody will generate the code for the main operation and the ADA packages, as well as the build file used to invoke the compiler environment selected in the configuration. Rhapsody is able to integrate with a number of different compilers, including ADA Core's GNAT Pro compiler chain here. You can also add new compiler environments and modify existing ones. Now, when we run the application, we can see that it runs for 5 seconds and then exits. Of course, at the moment the application doesn't do a lot other than initialize itself. However, this will enable us to illustrate the power of model-driven development with ADA by using graphical notations such as state machines to define the behavior of a class. Let's therefore add a state machine to the timer class. On the state machine, we'll say that the timer will have a single state called timing, and when in that state, it will transition every 1000 milliseconds out of and into the state, invoking the tick, followed by the print operations. We can then build again. The ability to rapid prototype and run the application this way means that I can detect problems early in the life cycle. Note that the model and the code are automatically kept in sync and the design documentation never loses relevance. Now we can see that the timer object is actually ticking. Of course, the whole point of state machines is that they can define and constrain behavior in a more abstract way. Note that if I drag requirement three and requirement four onto the diagram canvas, then we can see there is a requirement that the button is held for less than two seconds. It will stop and start. And also, if the button is held down for more than two seconds, then it should reset. Let's enhance class further by saying that the time will have two states, timing and not timing. We'll use another UML2 abstraction here that represents an asynchronous signal that can be sent to the class to cause it to toggle between these two states. We'll call this event EV short press. When a timer object is in the timing state and it receives an EV short press event, it will transition to the not timing state and vice versa. Since we have more than one state, we'll therefore say that it starts in the not timing state. Once these changes are made, we'll generate and make the application again. We can also annotate the diagram here to record that the transitions we added trace to requirement three. Note that as well as providing more information to the designer, Capturing traceability means that we can assess the completeness of the design more accurately and perform impact analysis as requirements inevitably change. Also, we can start to detect gaps or ambiguity in the requirements. This time, when the application runs, we see a blank console window and you might ask the question, what is happening? Well, this is because the timer class starts in the not timing state and it's waiting for an EV short press signal. Essentially, the system needs stimulus in order to exercise its functionality. This is where model-level debugging features of Rational Rhapsody come in. In particular, the ability to generate code with different settings from the same design. Returning to the configuration, we'll start by creating a copy of it. We'll rename this to Animation and set it as Active. We can see on the Settings tab that we're compiling with the GNAT Pro compiler and Artos adapter. For this configuration, I'm going to select Animation as the Instrumentation mode. 
This will add instrumentation to the running application so that we can both interact with it and see what's happening as it runs. When I generate and build this new version of the code, it is being generated to a different directory and is being linked with components that will enable model level debugging to work. When an animated application runs, an animation toolbar will then appear in Rhapsody. This is because my application will talk to Rhapsody via port on the machine. This is possible on most targets as well as a host machine as we're seeing here. Animation actually starts before the objects have been created. This enables us to debug the initialization sequence. For example, we can choose to create a sequence diagram showing the initialization. I'll drag the Builder, Timer and Display classes onto it as lifelines. Now when we hit Go in the Animation Toolbar, we can see the creation of the Display and Timer objects and we can see that the timer starts by entering the not timing state. With animation I can do more than just view what's happening. I can also interact with the running application. If we right click the lifeline and generate an EV short press event on the timer, we can see that the timer object enters the timing state and starts to tick. We can also generate another EV short press event to show the timer entering the not timing state. If we right click on the timer lifeline, we can also choose to open the animated state chart for the timer. Here we can see the current state of the object in pink. The state machine is really an integrated view of the different scenarios where states act to constrain the overall behaviour into more manageable chunks. The transitions are caused by asynchronous or synchronous messages sent to the object, UML2 abstractions that are very useful for building real-time and multi-threaded systems fast. This enables us to run the application to validate that the emergent behaviour is desirable and to locate unexpected scenarios that need to be dealt with. For example, although we did initialise the min and sex attributes, we did not update the display. Let's add a new operation to the timer class called reset. We'll get the reset to initialise the min and sex attributes to zero. We'll also get it to call the print operation on the object. We can now call the reset on the default transition. With model driven development you don't have to use state machines to define behaviour, however they do provide a very powerful abstraction. Essentially the code generator raises the level of abstraction to things that are important for developers to get right and removes effort spent on aspects that can be automatically generated. The code, however, is still readable and the user can still make edits that are round tripped in. In summary, model driven development means that the code and model is really the same thing and that we can build and execute to find and eliminate defects early. This ensures the relevance and completeness of the design documentation at all times in the project. This is very important in agile and incremental development as well as high integrity systems where traceability through design is mandatory. What's more, we can trace the design to aspects not captured in the code, such as use cases and requirements that explain why the design is as it is. Coding is only a small part of the development lifecycle, and ultimately only useful if you get the other parts right. This analysis is facilitated by using graphical notation to increase collaboration and understanding between people. Importantly, for ADA systems, which typically are long-lived and high-integrity, there is arguably no better way of doing this than document in your design with an industry standard notation. Note that model-driven development is not the only possible workflow with Rhapsody and ADA, since it's also possible to get Rhapsody to work with externally managed code. However, model-driven development acts to focus developers' time on things that require human creativity and domain expertise, leaving the code generator to ensure regularity of the code and keeping everything in sync.